Famous last words, but this one should be pretty quick. On the bench this evening, we have a Titera, also known as TYT, a TH9000D. This is a monoband mobile rig, 45 watts out, and uh, falls squarely under the cheap Chinese radio category, or CCRs as everybody likes to call them nowadays. Uh, these are actually not bad radios. The first ever ham radio I owned was a TH9000D, actually uh, identical to this one, and uh, that thing worked perfectly fine for uh, several years until I started acquiring more and more uh, Motorola gear. These are decidedly simple radios. They have a uh, eight character alphanumeric display, as you can see there. They program via chirp, just like a Baofeng. And uh, overall, if you're looking for an entry level ham radio, these are not the worst thing in the world, especially if you can pick one up second hand. I know on the used market, you can grab these things for like $80 all day, which for you know a, a 45 watt mobile rig is not too shabby. Uh, this one's on the bench today because it is misbehaving. A local ham in the area asked me to take a look at it. He said that he thinks it's uh, way off frequency. He said he has to tune almost uh, five kilohertz up before he uh, gets stations to come in clearly. He tested it on the local NOAA station, 14655, and I think he said it uh, didn't start coming in clearly until he went up to 146555. So, so we're gonna take a look at it, throw it up on the service monitor, run it through a full alignment, and uh, get it back to him in tip-top shape. And for those of you curious, this is my service monitor. It is an HP 8935. I don't think it falls into boat anchor territory, but it definitely falls squarely into oldie but a goodie territory. It was designed for testing uh, old cell base stations, you know, the old CDMA stuff. I think that's technically uh, 1G or 2G. But it also has a full suite of analog test tools, so it can test uh, FM, AM, SSB, CW. Covers from a couple hundred kilohertz all the way up to 1.7 gigahertz, which is fantastic for almost every ham radio need you will have. It has a plethora of I.O. on the side and can take uh, 75 watts continuous RF input power, which is fantastic for aligning uh, pretty much any radio you're going to come across. It can take 125 watts uh, intermittent power, which, you know, sometimes your repeaters and your uh, high power mobiles will get up that high. But I'd say 90 percent of the stuff I do is well below 75 watts. So this thing is absolutely fantastic. And on my bench, uh, space is at a premium, so finding an instrument that can combine a lot of different functions into one unit is a big plus. This thing is a spectrum analyzer, signal generator, modulation analyzer, oscilloscope, all those things in one unit. And uh, that just means I don't have to have a bunch of different discrete boxes taking up all of the space on my bench to do all those functions. So absolutely fantastic. I think I paid, oh, $500 for this thing uh, on eBay a couple of years ago. They're a little bit more expensive now, but uh, they still show up for pretty good bargains now and then. Uh, if you're looking for a good service monitor for your shack, uh, definitely keep an eye out for these things. Anyway, let's get this thing booted up because uh, it takes a while to warm up. Firmware date of 1999. I don't want to alarm some of you older folks in the crowd, but uh, I was born two years earlier. And here we are. I've got it set to RF analyzer mode, which gives you uh, a couple different really useful uh, metrics. So uh, on the top left here is frequency error, and that's just uh, how far off of your tune frequency the uh, carrier is. Uh, really, really useful when you're aligning a reference oscillator. TX power is below that. That is self-explanatory. It's the input power into the main RF port of this thing. Uh, this has a wideband RF power meter, so you don't actually have to tune to the specific frequency you're measuring the power of. Uh, regardless of what the frequency is, it will measure and uh, read out the power. FM deviation is here. That's how you uh, make sure that your FM modulation is within spec. And uh, AF frequency is down here. This one you can set to a couple different values. I have it set to AF frequency right now. It'll read out uh, what it's measuring the frequency of uh, your demodulated audio is. But you have a couple other options in here. You can measure uh, SNR distortion, sign add, uh, things like that if you're doing uh, receive performance measurements. So we've got the radio powered up and uh, tuned to 14652. That's two meter calling for those of you playing along at home. So we'll go ahead and uh, put that into the service monitor here, 146.52 megahertz, and go ahead and key up and see what it looks like. Get some nice feedback there because I'm holding the mic right next to the speaker. So we're putting out about 10 watts 
I'm not deviating very much. I can deviate a little bit more if I talk right into the mic there. Looks like we're peaking just under 5 uh, kilohertz, which is what you want for uh, wideband uh, deviation. And uh, yeah, take a look at the uh, frequency error measurement in the top left there. We are uh, negative 4.6 uh, kilohertz off frequency. So uh, the ham who gave this to me was absolutely correct. It is way off frequency. And uh, we're going to have to take a look at that and see if we can't pull it back in a little bit. So I did some hunting online to try and find uh, any type of service material for this radio, and I stumbled upon the Tiny Micros Wiki, which actually had a great article all about the TH9000D and its uh, various derivatives. And uh, as part of that article, they had service manuals and schematics posted, and this is one of them. This is the uh, block level diagram for the TH9000D. And I noticed something very interesting about this document. This is just an excerpt, but when I first opened it, I noticed that the title of the PDF was TM271A, and my brain immediately thought, hey, that's a Kenwood radio. So just because I was curious, I went and pulled the service manual for the TM271A, and well, take a look at this. Evidently, someone at Titera was feeling a little bit lazy when they were working on the service material. Now, obviously, there are some differences here. For instance, this big block of ICs here is totally missing on the Titera. Uh, they've changed the designation of the main microcontroller there. It's U4 in this one versus uh, IC301 in this one. Uh, most of the other designators are different as well. But it's interesting that the overall architecture is apparently identical. It's also interesting that this block diagram shows us pretty much everything except for how to adjust the reference oscillator. So we're going to have to dig a little bit further, probably open up the actual schematics and uh, take a look and see what we can find there. Oh boy. So this is just one page of the TH9000 schematics, but this is the majority of the RF and the IF stuff. So I figured we'd start here and uh, continue on down the rabbit hole if we didn't find what we were looking for. But one of the first things I did was just go through and label all the different ICs, so you'll see my beautiful handwriting here on the schematic, and you'll notice there's some strange things going on. For instance, we have a U1 up here, but we also have a U1 down here. We have a U3 here, and another U3 here. We have a U6A and a U6B, you know, two op amps in a single package, but then we have another U6B here. And we have a U6BA here, so I don't know what's going on with this schematic, and I don't know how much I'm going to be able to actually trust it. But I believe what we're interested in is down here in the bottom right corner. And it just crashed. I am so glad it saved my markup. Uh, anyway, what I was saying is if we go down here to the bottom right, I believe this is what we're interested in here. There's a 19.2 megahertz crystal, and that feeds into a LMX 1511, which is a phase lock loop chip. So I'm fairly certain if we want to do any type of frequency adjustment, we're going to have to do it here. I'm going to go ahead and open up the radio, see if I can't find X1 here, this 19.2 megahertz crystal. I'm going to hope that there's just a trimmer pot on it that lets you uh, tweak in the frequency. Unfortunately, I don't think it's going to be that easy, but we might get lucky. So let's go take a look. Let's take apart a radio. Well, that one's nice and stripped. Well, let's try this trick. You can sometimes get a Torx to fit into a uh, hex. And there we go. And we're in. Well, unfortunately, it's as I feared. Our 19.2 megahertz crystal is down there at the bottom, and it's a Bog standard crystal, no adjustment potentiometer, no nothing. So if we're going to adjust the frequency of this radio, uh, we're going to either need to dig around in the software and see if there's a, you know, a software reference oscillator adjustment, or potentially we'll have to replace that crystal with a new one. But I think it would behoove us 
to uh, power up the radio and probe the crystal line to make sure that it's actually off frequency because if the crystal's still dead on at 19.2 megahertz, putting a new one in there is not going to do anything and it's almost certain that something in software is going to have to be adjusted. So I'm going to fire up the scope and I'll probe up the crystal line there and we'll see what we see. Alrighty, I've got the uh, scope fired up. I've got my probe in times 10 mode and uh, we're going to go ahead and probe the crystal. Uh, I have it set to times 10 mode to prevent uh, the probe from loading the crystal down too much and changing its frequency or even, I don't know, causing it not to uh, oscillate properly. So uh, ideally you'd probe it with, you know, a super high impedance probe like a FET probe, but I don't own a FET probe because I'm not made of money. So we're going to go with times 10 mode and I think it'll be good enough for at least what we're doing here. So I believe it is this bottom right pin of the crystal. Okay, there's a signal. Let's uh, set up some triggering and zoom way the hell in. And there we go. Now, here is the problem. An oscilloscope is not a frequency counter. You'll notice the frequency measurement down there only goes to two decimal places, and that's not nearly good enough for what we need. I can make it a little bit better, or at least a little more stable, by uh, giving us more capture bandwidth to play with there, but it's still not great. You know, it's reading 19.20 megahertz, and when we're talking about a 5 kilohertz shift at 146 megahertz, that's about a 35 parts per million delta. And if you extrapolate that 35 parts per million delta down to 19.2 megahertz, you're talking about a, oh, roughly 650 hertz shift. And that's at least an order of magnitude lower than the resolution my scope can measure. So we're going to have to do this a different way. Allow me to introduce the other way. This is, once again, the HP 8935 service monitor. And I've got it set up in the same mode we saw earlier, uh, RF analyzer mode. Now this time I've got it tuned to 19.2 uh, megahertz, the same frequency as our crystal. And uh, I'm using this interesting little probe here. I don't know if you can see that well. Uh, it is just a little loop at the end of a piece of uh, RG316 coax. Uh, you just take the loop around and solder the uh, inner conductor to the shield. It makes a little uh, inductive coupling loop. And so what I'm going to do here is just hold this next to the 19.2 megahertz oscillator while it's running, and we should be able to measure the frequency of that oscillator just through some inductive coupling. I've got the uh, service monitor set to monitor off its antenna port here, which is a uh, very, very sensitive port. It can measure much, much lower powers than the actual uh, RF input port. So with any luck, this will be uh, enough power to get a reading on there, and we'll be able to take a uh, way, way more accurate uh, frequency measurement. So I'm just holding that loop right on top of the crystal, and you can see we do indeed have a measurement. You'll see it's about, uh, we're about 622-ish hertz low. And if you remember what I said earlier, uh, 35 parts per million was expected to be right around uh, 600 hertz. So, so that tells me that the crystal itself is actually bad. And I don't know if that's a good thing or a bad thing yet. We're going to have to take a look online and see if we can find uh, replacement parts for it. I'll have to uh, figure out what the form factor is and see if I can find uh, you know, another 19.2 megahertz oscillator that uh, has the same footprint, same uh, capacitance, all that good stuff. But with any luck, I'll be able to do that and uh, just desolder the old one, solder the new one in, and we'll be back right on frequency. So that's going to be about it for this video. I don't want to make these things too long. But I can assure you that this video is not going to go nearly as long as the Quantar series did. Hopefully in the next video you will see me uh, soldering in a new oscillator and the radio will just magically work, everything will be totally better, and I won't have to mess with it anymore, and it can finally go back to the ham who's been waiting on me to repair this for the better part of three or four months now. So thanks as always for watching. I hope you guys find this kind of stuff interesting, and uh, I'll try and get some more content out. Don't expect any kind of regular schedule from me. I do have a uh, real job that takes up most of my time, but as I'm doing cool stuff here in the lab, I'll try and at least uh, make short videos here and there to kind of show off some of the interesting RF-related things I'm up to. Talk to you next time. 
All right, so I almost just released that video without this little addendum, but I realized I was probably going to get all kinds of shit in the comments about being totally blind to what's going on in the schematic here. So let's take another look at this section here. This is the uh, reference oscillator, the 19.2 megahertz X1, and uh, this chip here, as I mentioned earlier, the LMX 1511, which is a phase lock loop chip that actually generates the uh, main uh, LO for the whole radio. So let's take a closer look at X1 here. I originally called it a crystal, but upon further review, I realized that that's not at all correct. Uh, a crystal would have loading capacitors and would go basically straight into an IC or straight into a microcontroller to provide its uh, reference clock. But in this case, you'll notice uh, the output of the crystal goes through a, a LC filter here and then into the uh, PLL. In a normal crystal, you wouldn't be able to do that because it's very, very sensitive to the uh, output capacitance and you'd have to make sure you had exactly the right amount of uh, capacitance on the two lines. This is an oscillator. And we can tell it's an oscillator because A, uh, it gets power from the 5 volt rail here. Uh, B, like I said, it goes through that uh, LC network, which a normal crystal normally wouldn't. And uh, C, it has this magic line here going through a uh, voltage divider and some extra filtering. This is the adjustment line for the oscillator. This is how you manually tweak in the oscillator's frequency. And I totally glanced over that. I mean, it's right here super obvious in the schematic, and I just basically ignored it and said, oh, that's just something weird. Uh, but yeah, no, it, it, it is very important to the schematic. So if you follow the trace up and over, it goes into this bus here as a freak, or I guess in this case, uh, frock, F-R-O-Q, uh, goes into the bus over here, comes out spelled correctly as freak, um, and also goes down here uh, into the master interface connector here as freak, pin 18 on that connector. And if we go to the other page of the schematic, what I'm calling the uh, digital side, comes out on pin 18 and pretty much goes through a couple more filtering uh, capacitors and resistors and then straight into the main microcontroller. So this radio does have electronic frequency adjustment and that means there must be some kind of service mode you can enter to manually tweak in the frequency. I have been totally unable to find that up to this point. I have put out requests on Reddit, on a couple other forums. Nobody seems to know anything about these radios or how to get them into what I'm assuming is some kind of test mode or something that lets me adjust that reference oscillator. So we're still going to end the video here. I need to do some more research on this radio, but that's going to be the key to getting this thing back on frequency. We need to figure out some way to get into that CPU or get into some kind of maintenance mode on the front panel and adjust that reference oscillator manually and get it back on frequency. So like I said in the fake outro for this video, thanks a bunch for watching and stay tuned for part two of this series.